Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining our Surviving and Thriving Lecture Series. We are excited today to have um, Caitlin Smith from Physio Partners with us, and she is going to talk about um, uh, peripheral neuropathy and um, strategies to manage pain and discomfort. So um, without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Caitlin. Thanks for joining us. Hi guys, I'm excited to be here. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen um, and we can start talking. Um, so I do have um, like some questions embedded in there because I find it's always um, more fun when it's not just me talking to you guys when we're all talking together and it's a little more interactive. Um, so if you wanna come off mute when we have the questions and participate, let me know. Um, you can also, contribute in the chat and I'll kind of be monitoring that as we go too. Um, but yeah, we'll go ahead and get started. All right, hold on one second. All right. All right. Perfect. Sorry, I haven't done one in, <laughs> I haven't done a Zoom presentation in a little bit. I got rusty. Great. All right. So as I said today, um, I'm going to be talking about managing um, cancer-related peripheral neuropathy um, and kind of focusing, we'll kind of go over just where it comes from, what it is, define it, because it's always nice to have that background information. Um, and we'll really kind of focus on more pain management and chronic pain management. So even if you're not experiencing peripheral neuropathy, if you're dealing with some chronic pain, um, we'll hopefully have some good information for you. Um, and we'll kind of talk about what it is, what's out there, um, and just kind of understand what we can do about it. Cause it's not a fun thing to deal with. If anyone is here dealing with it today, you guys probably know. Good. Um, so first, just defining peripheral neuropathy. Um, so we have the two parts of our nervous system. We have the central nervous system, which includes our brain and spinal cord. Um, and then our peripheral neuro nervous system is all the nerves that connect and take, carry the information from our brain and spinal cord to our body and bring the information back. Um, so this is something that is commonly can be affected by a couple different things, but some certain chemotherapies um, and conditions can cause damage to those peripheral nerves um, and cause some pain and cause some other symptoms that we'll talk about in a second. Um, so when we are using that term, when you hear that term peripheral neuropathy, um, that just refers to damage that occurs anywhere along that nerve pathway. Um, like that chemotherapy and cancer treatments aren't the only thing that can affect it. Um, it can also, diabetes is a common one that can cause damage to those nerves. Those fluctuations of blood sugar over time can start damaging them. Um, rheumatoid arthritis, um, certain vitamin deficiencies, um, all of those can cause damage to our peripheral nerves. Um, so uh, just to kind of draw your attention to the slides, we kind of have this on the, Left side is you have kind of see the healthy nerve and you can see some of the redness and the damage. Um, and it's kind of showing the pro progression of damage that happens to that nerve over time. Um, so as we'll kind of talk with chemotherapy, it's rarely that first treatment of chemo that is gonna cause the damage. It's that accumulation of damage over time um, that is causing that nerve to wear down. Um, and the further along it goes, the more symptoms we're gonna see. All right, um, so um, when we're talking about chemotherapy-induced peripheral neuropathy, um, these are typically caused by drugs that we, are, we know are neurotoxic. So we know they're damaging to the nervous system. Um, some of the common drugs they found are the vincristines, the taxanes, the platinums, um, andromycin. Those are ones that we know can just have more risk of damaging um, our peripheral nerves. Um, everyone's a little different, not just because you've had one of these you know, chemotherapies in your past doesn't mean that you'll necessarily have damage to your nervous system. Um, these are just ones that we know can we have to watch for because they can cause some damage to peripheral nerves in some patients. Um, sensory nerves, so everything bringing sensation um, from our fingertips and toes and our body back to our spinal cord and brain tend to be affected first, just kind of due to where they're located and their size. Um, and like that, it's kind of, it's not going to happen immediately. It happens. It's a lot of times it's that, you know, it's kind of based on how much chemotherapy you're re re 
receiving what the dosage is, what the pacing of it is, but usually those nerves get kind of damaged over time. Um, and so you won't, might not see symptoms right away. You might get symptoms that kind of are, have a delayed onset because it's not, you know, that damage is slowly building up over time. Um, so we're kind of finding that it can occur like that. It can occur anytime during chemotherapy treatment. I saw a recent study that looked at like some people weren't getting symptoms until two months after they finished their chemotherapy treatment. Um, so it's just something to kind of, if you're going through treatment right now to kind of monitor and just be, just talk to your healthcare provider if you start having some of the symptoms that we'll talk about. Um, and you can sometimes get neuropathy caused from radiation, surgery, or just the tumor itself where it's positioned, um, what it's pressing on, um, but that's a little bit less common, but that you can still get similar symptoms from things that aren't chemotherapy. Yes. Um, the statistics really go all over the place. Um, I always like to kind of update my lectures. Um, when I'm doing them. Um, so like I, that 19% to 85% was a very recent study. Um, so there, and it was looking at a bunch of, kind of looking at a bunch of different studies on chemotherapy induced peripheral neuropathy. Um, so they were really finding wide ranges, um, but we do know those certain chemotherapies that are more neurotoxic, we're gonna see are in that 70 to 90% range. Ones that are less neurotoxic, we're seeing lower in that 19 to 20% range. Um, so the one nice thing too, to keep in mind with that is that this is kind of looking during chemo, like these studies were all looking during treatment. Um, another study kind of followed patients for more than six months post-treatment. And they found that, um, in that study, 68.1 had it the first month after chemotherapy, but by three months post, it gone dropped down to 60 and by six months post, it dropped down to 30. Um, so when we kind of go back to that picture, the nerve that we saw a few slides ago, um, there is a lot of people who maybe are having some symptoms, having some effect, um, but there is at a certain point, there can be some healing that can occur depending on how far along and how, it, how cumulative the damage is. So we're kind of seeing that in the study that just because you have symptoms right after you finish um, chemotherapy, it doesn't mean your body can't heal. Um, there is a certain point where the nerve can get damaged and then we can have these symptoms lingering long beyond treatment, um, but that's 30% of people is much better than 70% of people with certain, with certain um, chemotherapies. Um, some of the risk factors they found is that if you have previous neuropathy from another condition, so if you have type two diabetes, that can be kind of a red flag that some, you might have more symptoms than the, another person who didn't have type two diabetes. Alcoholism can cause, um, some damage to the nerves. Um, and that can also put your, you know, if your nerves are already damaged, it's going to take that much more to push them over the edge and have pain and symptoms, um, nutritional problems or nutritional issues. Once again, we know can damage the nerves. So we want those nerves as healthy as, as they can be um, if we're gonna be going, having chemotherapy with a neurotoxic substance. Um, age, it's kind of mixed reviews. They think some, as you get older, you might be more at risk, but then there's been some, some studies that show that there really hasn't been that correlation between age and um, incidence of peripheral neuropathy. So there's still more research we kind of need to do about that. Um, so what does it feel like? How do you know what peripheral neuropathy is? Um, so generally we talk about the stocking and gloves. You can kind of see the picture. Um, so we're gonna find the damage is gonna be more distal first. Um, so fingers and toes, a lot of times the toes tend to get hit first. Um, you'll feel sensation there. And then as the damage progresses, you'll start feeling sensations in the hands. Um, definitely when we're looking at neuropathy with the di diabetic population, they, it commonly follows that pattern. Sometimes with chemotherapy, um, it seems to be a little more varied in patient report. Um, so we do more often hear patients explaining, you know, kind of reporting they had it in their hands first and their feet weren't too bad. Um, everyone's a little different, but in general, when you start feeling symptoms in those fingertips and toes, that's kind of a sign that something's going on with your peripheral neuro nerve system. Um, so what it nerves are, they bring all kinds of sensation in. So neuropathy can really feel different depending on the patient. Um, so a lot of the times people report numbness, tingling, that kind of feeling you get when your foot's falling asleep and it's coming back awake. Um, some will just kind of, it just feels 
set things feel different. It doesn't feel the same when you're touching things. Um, sometimes you'll have this kind of hyper response to pain to, you know, to stimuli that aren't painful, but it'll, your brain will be telling you it's pain. Burning, shooting, or electric shock are kind of common words that we've heard to describe the pain that patients are feeling. Um, as damage progresses or if damage progresses, um, you can also get um, more impacts and loss of temper sen temperature sensation. Um, some people can't feel vibration, um, decreased proprioception. So that's kind of our awareness of where our body is in space that can get affected as damage kind of accumulates. Um, and then muscle weakness and loss of control movement can also happen um, if those motor nerves start getting involved which is less common and kind of more in severe cases of peripheral neuropathy. Um, yeah, and so someone asked about the Charlie horse kind of pain. Um, yeah, a lot of times that what you might be feeling, um, it could just be the nerves telling you that wrong information. So it could just be that you're um, having, like the nerves are telling your brain, there's pain, there's this tight muscle, this cramp, when there isn't, um, because when nerves get damaged, they like to send us all kinds of mixed up messages to our brain. Um, you could also, if you're getting more of that kind of traverse type of pain, um, you could also be having um, some muscle weakness and then those muscles are getting overworked a little bit more and it could be more muscular in nature. Um, but yeah, that's another type of pain that people might be having. Good. Okay, so here's our first opportunity for people to share. Um, have you or a loved one experienced neuropathy? What did you experience and how would you describe it? Can I jump in? Yeah, go ahead. That, is it Mila? Yeah, it's Mila. Mila. I have neuropathy for many years. I okay. have uh, injury car accident both of my ankles was messed up okay. and there was like a lot of surgery on the ankles and the right one is fused there is no joint and I had a lot of neuropathy in the right foot which was going worse over years and after chemo it became really bad doctor even had to stop doing chemo in two months even though she chose the chemo, which I forgot the name, but it was the one which can affect the heart. It wasn't supposed to give me much neuropathy, but it gave yeah. any day. My big toe become red and very bad, so she stopped chemo. And since then, uh, it got a little better, but over years, it has been almost three years since then, since chemo, two and a half years. And uh, since then, it's getting little worse, or it's staying the same, but I guess it would get a little worse if I didn't have every month acupuncture and massage. Mm -hmm. I don't know which one is helping more, acupuncture or massage. And, uh, and for the last three months, I was an extremistin oxygen blocker because I have breast cancer. <laughs> so it's hormone medicine, and uh, it gave me a lot of problems. First, I was kind of tolerating it, but after one year and a half, uh, it got so bad I couldn't tolerate it anymore. And doctor put me on full withstand, and I have been okay. three months on full withstand. Tomorrow it's gonna be what it's supposed to be. My fourth shot, full withstand. It's usually once a month. Okay. It's Son gave me a lot of neuropathy. It's like two times more mm -hmm. than I have. And I just don't know what to do. I'm thinking not to have tomorrow's shot because it's not getting any better. First, uh, first I got fully start. I have those shooting pain. But now the shooting, very sharp pain, almost mm -hmm. gone, but the foot is really numb and painful. And my balance become so bad. I, I used to do my shopping on power wheelchair because of mess up my ankles. And, uh, but I was walking with the walker outside for half hour, but in the buildings I walk without walker. But now I cannot go anywhere without walker. Sometimes yeah. at home I have to grab something not to fall. And I don't know if I should continue this full stunt 
or we will get bet better if I stop doing it, you know. Or yeah. another question I have. Mm -hmm. If it didn't get much better right after chemo, like a few months later, can it get better over time, years later? You know? Yeah. Yeah. So we'll talk about that. Um, yes, we will talk about that. Like what happens if it doesn't just go away? Um, so we'll kind of get into that in a couple so slides. I got it three times. Sure. My surgery, yeah. one after another on the same foot, and then because then chemo now full restaurant, you know. Yeah. Yeah, so we will talk about it. Thank you so much for sharing, Mila. Um, yeah, so we're hearing some of those, a lot of that, like the, yeah, you had some damage and then the chemotherapy made it worse. Um, Mandy in the chat described that tingly feeling, that pins and needles, um, and then that throbbing thing, like, oh yeah, so you're almost, sorry, I'm reading her chat. It's almost like that vibration feeling too. Um, so yeah, everyone's a little different in how they're feeling it because it all of our nerves, you know, it just kind of depends which specific sensory nerves are being affected. Talking on needles, um, numbness and pain, we're hearing a lot. Um, and Ali, do you have a question? Yes, I do. Oh, great. Ali, go ahead, jump in. Sorry. Yes, I've seen a lot of the screens. <laughs> Thank you for the back. I, I got, I, um, I guess I got neuropathy after the uh, treatment for the uh, mm -hmm. cancer. Yeah. And at first I was doing just fine, but then it seems like it, I'm like, um, I'm, I'm two and a half months out okay. and, I'm in, and I'm in remission. But the thing is, it seems like all of a sudden the uh, neuropathy is getting like for the last, I guess the last couple of three months, it's been, yeah. it's been affecting my, the way I walk. And also, okay. I no, does it cause swelling in your leg or no? Um, that could be something different. Um, you could get swelling if you're losing some, um, like losing some function or some movement in the legs. Um, but that might, you, you know, it may might be more related to how mobile you're being if you're, if you're having this pain. Well, I'm not. I'm not. I'm. I'm very mobile. Okay. I'm very, you know. And I'm right now. I'm in physical therapy. Go ahead. Okay. Because of the, um, you know, uh, the the balance, the balance because because of the neuropathy, and yeah. my hands, you know, my hands aren't. I, I don't have any pain in my hands, but they're just numb feeling. You know, the tips are numb, and my feet is they're they're numb feeling as well, and they don't they don't hurt, but yeah. it's very uncomfortable to try and walk. So yeah. I'm. You know, is will that go away, or is the possibility that it will not go away? Um. So we'll kind of like we are going to get into that. Um. Yeah. Talk about that. Um. So there is like that. We're kind of seeing that, like you know, every as the chemotherapy, you're, that damage, you know, it's coming on slowly. Um. And a lot of people, like that, like I said, are kind of showing symptoms after they stop. Um. Mm -hmm. The chemotherapy because it's that damage kind of accumulating over time. Um because like it's been more recent and you're doing some physical therapy, um, that's, you're really like, the, we'll talk about some things that can help make it a little bit better, um, but getting kind of treatment early can help, even if it's been a long time, there's a lot of pain management strategies that we'll talk about and kind of go over that can still be helpful to manage the pain, even if we can't fix neuropathy. So it's sort of, it kind of depends, sometimes we can, get in there and get some good exercise and circulation and, and help Im improve those nerves. Sometimes we're doing strategies after the fact to help it, like kind of monitor, help fix what the nerves, the nerve damage has caused. And also when I, mm -hmm. when I finished chemo, when I first finished chemo or uh, shortly thereafter, I went in, I mean, I started therapy for the neuropathy, oh, good. And, you know, right after that. And then I was fine until, like I said, a few months ago, and then it started yeah. to affect my walking yeah. thing, you know. Yeah. So our so stockings, that, those compression stockings, is that good? Is that good? Those are uh, good. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Compression is good. Um okay, thank you. Great. Um so in the chat it looks like we have someone talking about like a power surge through their body. Um yeah and just feeling that it, it's been kind of a longer time for other people. Good. Um you have okay. another question as well here, but I want to make sure also in the interest of time, so you decide kind of what 
what you can yeah. uh what it's you can okay do. we don't have i don't have to ask the question now okay great yeah we'll have more time to share yeah great all right um okay so we've heard we kind of jumped ahead we heard some people referring how it's really why neuropathy matters, why talking about this matters. Um, so there is an association between um, peripheral neuropathy and decreased quality of life and increased health costs for people. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of cancer survivors in the U.S. It's growing, which is wonderful. We want that. Um, but we need to make sure that we're managing these long-term side effects too, so that we, this cancer population that you guys are moving on and living the best life that you can um, and having the best quality of life post -treatment. Um, So as people shared, weakness and decreased balance is very common. Um, when we have decreased balance, we have increased risk of falls. Falls can cause all kinds of other problems. Um, so we know that we want to be addressing neuropathy, um, whether it's been, it's new or whether it's been bothering you for a while, because we want you guys everyone should be able to return safely to all the things you need to do and all the things you want to do. Um, and it's just not fun to be in pain. Pain stinks and nerve pain, as a lot of you guys are sharing, is especially rough. It, it's a very tough type of pain. Um, so we don't want people living with living their life and we want to be managing it. Um, okay, so just to kind of briefly go over the stuff that I'm not going to talk about as much because it's not really my area, be more stuff to talk about with your physician. Um, so during treatment, um, when you, a lot of times they're getting much, there's a lot more awareness about peripheral neuropathy. Um, we're understanding what these, these drugs um, are doing. So a lot of oncologists are modifying chemotherapy dosage administration. Um, they're monitoring sim symptoms. Um, there's even been a push to really talk before you even start chemotherapy about any other risk factors um, and having that as much as you safely can um, kind of guide which chemotherapies we're doing. Um, and like that, that early intervention, so um, getting right into physical therapy, all of that can be really important. Um, medical management, there's not a lot of great support yet. There's still a lot of research that needs to be done. Um, so they there's different medical pain medications they're um, trying. There's different medications, um, like specifically for nerve pain um, that they try, but a lot of those can have kind of a lot of side effects. Um, so for some people, um, it's sort of you know, the side effects are kind of as bad as the neuropathy. So it's kind of a choice with that. Um, so they're still really kind of working to find better medications that can help management. Um, but yeah, so there's just still more work we have to do there. Um, and then post-treatment physical therapy um, can be really helpful if you're having a lot of symptoms with balance and your lower extremity occupational therapy, which is what I do, can be really helpful if you're feeling more symptoms in your hands. Um, if you're having trouble doing the things you need to do safely, like getting in the shower or cooking or doing the laundry, those type of things. Um, or if you're having trouble um, with like your diet, it can be really helpful. Good. Um, so we've kind of talked, we'll probably come back to this. Let's get through, there's a couple slides. Um, so we'll talk, I'm gonna kind of overview some of the stuff that's out there and then we'll kind of talk about what people have tried and what has been helpful in their journey. Um, so the first thing I'd like to talk about is we're gonna kind of take a side step and talk about pain and pain management because whether you're having neuropathy and it's newer or whether you've had it for 10 years, as someone shared, um, one of the big components of your treatment should be talking about pain management. Um, so anytime we're having pain, we know we have this physical source of pain, um, in this case, those nerves, um, but we also know we have that cognitive reaction to pain. Um, and so pain really does, you know, it's coming, it's being processed in the brain. So there's certain things that can really make our pain worse um, and that aren't related to the physical aspects of it. Um, and there's things that can kind of, there's a cycle we can kind of get stuck in that can kind of perpetuate pain and make pain last um, for much longer than it should. Um, so a lot of the pain research is kind of talking about this and this is not just peripheral neuropathy, it's any type of pain that isn't going away that you can, you can kind of insert here. Um, but we know that pain, when we're in pain, we're stressed. Our system is stressed, we're not feeling well. Um, 
And that can lead to feelings of, of not being well, which in turn can make our brain more attentive and more focused on the pain. So we're actually, our brain is actually perceiving the pain a little bit worse, which is just gonna, like I, you can kind of see a picture, it's just gonna feed back into that stress cycle. Um, and it's just gonna make everything worse and worse. Um, so one of the big things um, that pain management has really looked at is that we have always, for years, we've really focused on like treating the physical qualities of pain. Um, but now all the research has really shifted and said that we need to really deal with those cognitive parts of pain. So we need to break that cycle um, as best we can and that kind of trick our brain into not being hyper-focused on the pain, not being stressed, depressed, or anxious, um, because all of that is actually making our pain feel a little bit worse. So how do we do that? Um, so education is key. There's one study specifically to peripheral neuropathy that just showed that when patients were better informed, um, when they were informed of what to expect ahead of time, they managed their symptoms better. So just knowing can be really important. Um, when I first started doing this lecture, like probably five or six years ago now, um, there wasn't as much awareness. It wasn't really addressed. There's a lot more awareness um, out there in cancer treatment centers. Um, oncologists are really good about addressing it now. Um, so I think it's very important it's just knowing that this is a possible side effect, you know, it can just make you feel prepared um, versus if you have no idea and you're, for some of you guys who've had it for some, for decades or five years, um, you maybe weren't told. And so suddenly you're having these strange symptoms. Um, and that is just, that's a lot scarier because when we don't know where pain or these strange symptoms are coming from. Managing or reducing stress is really important when we're talking about pain management. Um, emotional support can be really important, especially because things like peripheral neuropathy or chronic pain are what we would call like an invisible disability. Um, so it, you look, you know, you don't have any obvious signs you have neuropathy, you don't have any signs that you're, you're in pain. Um, and so that can make it a little bit harder to communicate to those in your life. Um, it can make you feel like, you know, if you're having some weakness in your foot and you need to take a rest, um, you might feel like you look like you should be more active than you, you can. So there's not anything obvious to kind of cue people into that, to let you know that you're having some, something going on. Um, and then psychosocial support is also a really important of pain management strategy. Good. Um, so really quick, we'll just do a quick poll because um, I do want to get through everything. Um, has anyone ever experienced this where they've noticed that interaction between their emotions and your pain? Um, and so kind of with that cycle too, we know that bad emotions can make our pain worse. Um, we also know good emotions, um, positive emotions can make our pain a little bit better. We have our bodies really good at providing natural pain support um, if we're cueing it the right way. Um, so does anyone, if one or two people want to share about like a time when they've noticed either oh, I was really stressed and my pain was out of control or the opposite is I was having this great day and it was like my pain disappeared for a day. Um, Barbara? Oh, Barbara, I think you're still on mute. Okay, sorry. Um, I find if I, the best thing for me is distraction. Uh, yep. So I try and get outside, particularly now that the weather's nice. I find just getting outside, just even walking down the street, looking to see what flowers are up um, or reading. I just try to keep real busy. And it does sort of distract you, not if you're in super pain, obviously, but from yeah. a lot of that kind of nagging neuropathy that's constant in my feet. Mm -hmm. Some days it goes up the legs, it's worse, whatever, but the kind of when it's just kind of at an even constant in the feet, I find if I'm actively doing something, trying to focus on something else, that it just kind of takes your attention away from it. Yeah. Yeah, no, it can be it can be really powerful, can it be? Um, and so that's kind of a good experience to kind of know and that we can kind of talk more about what are some ways we can like kind of set our schedule to really keep ourselves distracted so we're not we're having a lot of the good things in our life 
um, and we're not focusing on these negatives because we're actually, it is gonna help really get rid of some of that chronic um, nagging pain. Definitely. Anyone else that wanted to share real quick? Thank you, Barbara. No, okay. Okay, um, yeah, so let's continue on. So um, one thing that tends to happen when we're talking about pain and we're talking about um, pain that's really lingering and chronic and overwhelming our life is that we're not being balanced in our life, right? So when you're in pain, um, a lot of times um, you're just kind of getting through the day as best you can. So sometimes things like getting dressed, um, eating breakfast, just getting, you know, taking a shower, all those things we kind of have to do every day. Um, those are causing so much pain or they're, they're so fatiguing because of the pain that you're just kind of getting through your basic life activities. Um, and the first thing we tend to sacrifice are the things that matter or the things we want to do. Um, so if you have to go to work and work is causing you pain, you might be coming right home and just crashing and you're not going out to see friends, you're not going to movies or reading books or doing the things that we want to do. Um, so that right there can kind of really offset that pain stress cycle um, because we're not, be, we need to be balanced. Everybody needs to be balanced in order to feel happy and healthy. Um, and so when this kind of, you can kind of see on the board, when the things that we have to do overwhelm everything, we're not being balanced. We need this balance of the things we want to do and the things we have to do um, because that's going to make us feel good. Um, and then kind of in the back, I have that personal factors, roles and rituals. So those are kind of like, you know, if you have kids and you're, you're in pain and you can't button their onesies because your, your hands hurt or you can't go to your grandkids recital because you're in too much pain, um, you're not feeling like you're able to enact some of those roles the same way as we want. Um, and that can kind of really cause a lot of um, lack of self-esteem or lack, lack of worth or feelings of not being a worth or feelings of not being fulfilled in your life because you're not doing everything you can um, you can or you want to do. Um, I would say generally in the cancer survivor population, I do find that that can be, a, that's kind of a common thing that a lot of survivors struggle with is that once you get through treatment, um, regardless of everything else, the pain aside, um, you've been a patient and you this being a patient and going through cancer treatment has kind of overwhelmed everything else and everything else has been put on the back burner. But now you're done and you're healthy and you got that clean bill of health and you're trying to get back in your life. Um, but it's not the, it's not as easy as we like to think it is. Um, you know, I think a lot of times cancer centers are like, here you go, you're done with treatment, go off and, and do it. Um, and I think, you know, a lot of you guys can probably test to is that it's not as easy to get back to our, our life and get back to the balance life when we've had this big thing like a cancer diagnosis overwhelm everything and overwhelm everything we need to do. Um, so I think that, and then when you add something like a long-term side effect, such as pain, that can make it that much harder to balance. Um, so when we're talking about pain management, we're really trying to strive and get this balanced life. So we're feeling well and we're feeling successful um, and we're getting all those natural painkillers. Um, we'll come back to that. Um, so we'll come back to some of these questions again, just so we get through everything. Okay. I always have too much information, um, which is, you know, that's all right. <laughs> it's good. Um, okay, so what are things that we talked about some pain management? We'll talk a little bit more at the end. We'll have some time to talk about them more at the end. Um, some other strategies can be really helpful for peripheral neuropathy. Um, so getting moves, moving, physical activity is just really healing. Um, we're getting that good circulation. We're challenging the sensory system when we're moving. Um, we're challenging our body awareness um, and we're strengthening. We're keeping everything nice and strong. So finding ways to get active can be really helpful. Um, so if you're feeling like for some of you guys who have like, I know some of you are in PT, um, if you're feeling like balance is really an issue um, or just that you're getting a lot of muscle, you're feeling weaker, you're, you're getting some muscle, Charlie horses or muscle weakness, um, it's always nice to get a referral to see a physical therapy. They can do a very detailed evaluation, let you know what, how are your muscles balanced? Is everything as strong as it needs to be? Um, and do some good kind of guide you through some exercises to get you back to where you need to be. Um, if you're just kind of feeling, you know, it's not as severe, but you still don't feel like super comfortable with your balance. Um, like Tai Chi can be a really nice, low impact way to work on balance, to work on strength. 
Um, it's good for your feet and your hands. Yoga is another great way to work on some balance um, to get you moving. Um, and the nice thing with Tai Chi and yoga is that we're going to get that element of mindfulness, which we'll talk about in a bit, that can also help with some of that pain, our pain management plan. Um, good. Um, and so part of that, what we're seeing with a lot of people's peripheral neuropathy, um, about, well, just a little bit less than 12% are reporting falls post having this onset of cancer-related peripheral neuropathy. Um, so that, that's not a huge you know, that's, it's still a concerning number, um, but it's not everyone who's having peripheral neuropathy are falling, but almost 30% are on are reporting not being able to do light stuff. So things like not feeling comfortable in the shower, um, not being able to walk, go on a walk, um, not feeling comfortable moving around the kitchen. So even when, even if you're not feeling like you're going to fall, this pain and these changes in your body can make it hard to do, do a, your life activities. Um, and so um, one thing that OT can be really helpful with is kind of figuring out how to adapt. And this is something, sorry, my terrier wants to be involved. Um, if you can hear him, I apologize. <laughs> um, so this is something OT can be really helpful with helping um, is kind of figuring out, and this can be something, whether it's new onset of peripheral neuropathy or you've had it for 10 years, um, OT can really help you look at like, can we change what you're doing? Can we simplify it? Can we give it to somebody else so you can do something else you enjoy more? Um, is your environment supporting your, your ability to do the stuff? Is it as safe as it can be? Um, and then is there a way we can change up your routine so you're staying healthy and balanced? Um, so this is another option for profanopathy of consulting an OT like that. We work a lot on environmental adaptation, um, adaptive equipment, as well as kind of the physical, like we tend to take the hands and the, the fine motor and all that dexterity stuff. So also treating some of the physical stuff too. Um, this is just a sampling of some equipment that we use a lot. I recommend a lot to patients. Um, so if you're having falls, grab bars are always nice. Having somewhere to sit in the shower is a great safety thing. Um, this little doodad here in the corner, down in the corner is a button hook. It's really great if you're having trouble with dexterity. If you're trying to get those buttons on a shirt, um, it does it for you. It looks elaborate, but it's actually pretty easy to use. Um, watching some of those changes in sensation. We want to keep your hands safe when you're cooking. So oven mitts, heat resistant gloves when you're cooking or handling hot stuff can be really important. Okay. Um, and then we'll get back into kind of more of the staying balanced stuff. Um, good, okay. And so the other thing, kind of part of the pain management plan or just helpful anytime you're dealing with pain is to incorporate some element of mindfulness or meditation. Um, it's something we should all be doing. I like to do it. <laughs> it's great for everybody. It, it works on mindfulness and meditation is helpful for so many different things. Um, you know, anxiety, stress, um, sleep quality, lowering your blood pressure is great. Um, but it is a really helpful strategy in pain management is kind of finding these moments of calm, staying in the moment, um, and incorporating it throughout your day and throughout your schedule can be really important, um, to kind of keep your natural body's natural painkillers going, um, break that stress pain cycle that we talked about earlier, um, and just make us feel better. Um, so there's always mindful, there's a lot of mindfulness apps out there now, which are nice. You can just set it. It'll cue you every day to do a little guide you through meditation, calms one, headspace another. Um, so those are kind of a nice, easy way to do it. Um, just breathing, breath work. Um, we'll show you the figure eight breathing in a couple slides. We can kind of practice that one together. Um, this gratitude jar is something I, actually one of my patients, practice this um, and I stole it from them because I thought it was a great idea. Just practicing gratitude every day can be a nice way of just taking that moment of mindfulness and building this practice around being in the moment. Um, journaling, some people really enjoy journaling. Um, I know somebody else um, mentioned like getting outside, how being out, going outside and walking can be really important. Um, now that it's finally, like we were talking about the very beginning of it, it's finally warm. It's really nice to get um, to get outside. I think we all need that right now in Chicago. Um, and then sometimes just doing a simple sensory inventory. So what is something I can see? What is something I can hear? Can, what can I smell? What can I touch? Um, or just like if you're cooking and stuff, really taking that moment to take in like, oh, these strawberries, what, they're such a nice red. They taste so good and fresh. Um, and really kind of using all our sensations to keep ourselves in the moment is going to keep our brain from focusing on the pain. 
Yes, and Ross put it, I always like to do a plug for Gilda's, but Ross reminded me. Yes, so you can always utilize Gilda's Club because they have tons of mindfulness, yoga, tai chi. Um, so you've got a lot of stuff in your community um, that you can access. So nice little plug for Gilda services there. Yeah, the, the Gilda's really, yeah, Ali, Gilda's really does offer so many stuff um, that can be really helpful. Painting, there's a, I don't know if you're still doing painting, Ross, but I, I know the painting class has been really helpful. You're working on that fine motor, you're moving everything, you're getting everything going. Um, but then you're also, um, you know, getting this like fun, enjoyable activity back. We do, we do, uh, are continuing to do various art sorts of things. Yes, so absolutely. Perfect, good. Good. So this is an example of um, the figure eight breathing. Sorry, managing a lot. Good. Um, so this is a nice one. Um, we, if we have time at the end, we'll go back and do it together. Um, I like to teach every patient, not just cancer patients, all my patients who are dealing with any pain, this exercise. Um, so what you're doing is you're going to be tracing the figure eight. As you go around one side, you're going to take a breath in. As you come back out, you're going to take a breath out. Um, and I like this one because once you know the exercise, you can do it anywhere. You can trace it on your hand. You can trace it on your leg as you're sitting. If you're in a doctor's appointment, you're really stressed out. You can do a couple figure eight breathings right there without anyone noticing it um, and kind of help calm yourself down. Um, and for some people, like, you know, a lot of times if you're having pain and it's unexpected and you're out somewhere and you don't have your tools at hand to help deal with it, breath work is a great thing to come back to because we can instantly start kind of stopping that stress cycle, getting ourselves back in our body and focusing on the calm so that our brain isn't overreacting to the pain. Good. Um, so let's go over some other safety things with proper neuropathy. Um, fall prevention is really important. Like we said, it's a small percentage that are actually falling, um, but it's just good practice to have anytime we're feeling some balance issues or feeling less confident in our body um, because of pain or um, weakness. Um, and especially with peripheral neuropathy, um, because like some people like when they're recording, they're getting this sudden shooting pain. Um, that can be a risk factor if you're around a lot of clutter or you're getting out of the shower and that's when the pain kind of kind of hits, um, that can make it a little bit more risky and more likely to have the fall. Um, so just some very basic fall prevention tips that are helpful, um, making sure your rooms and hallways are well lit, having night lights or motion activated lights along the pathways to bathroom at night um, so you're not stumbling around in the dark. Um, I'm an OT, we don't like small area rugs or bath mats because they're big tripping hazards. Um, so that's always something we, if you're worried about your balance, those are things we just need to go. We need to make sure they're really, um, they're not going to be, you, you can't catch a toe or trip on it. Um, they're nice and flattened down or adhered to the, the surface. Clutter, clutter is another thing. Um, we don't want things in the, especially hallways and stuff or indoor, you know, kind of pathways throughout our homes. We wanna make sure there isn't clutter that we could be bumping into. Um, if you spill something, make sure you're cleaning it up right away, um, especially if you're having a lot of numbness in your foot um, because you might not, you know, you're not gonna feel it the same way. And so you, you, it could be a big slipping hazard. Um, and then just organizing any kitchen or workspaces so that heavier items are all about waist level, just easier balance-wise to reach and grab those. And then all your frequently used items are in easy reach. So you're not constantly going up on tippy toes to grab a bowl that you use all the time. Um, we wanna kind of rearrange stuff so it's more functional and it's preventing us from reaching really low down to the ground or reaching way high up. Um, I'm a short person, so that's kind of my whole life. Um, but anytime you're up in these kind of higher patterns and reaching, it's challenging our balance system a lot. Okay. Um, if you're having some numbness and tingling in your hands or your feet, here's just kind of a nice self-care practice that you should start doing. Um, so one for hand care, if you're feeling numb, you always want to make sure you're touching water, water temperature, especially like a shower or bath with a non-affected part. Um, so if it's your fingers and hands, like your elbow's a good one, you can reach in and dip with that. Um, but you don't wanna just be using your fingers because if you're not feeling that hot cold the same way, um, it, you know, that if the, it's a lot hotter and you jump in and you're not expecting it, that could be a fall risk or, you know, potentially just not fun to jump in the hot water. Um, so not a fun experience for you. Um, I kind of showed the oven mints, wearing oven mints are really helpful. Um, I like the gloves that are really covering your hands. Um, 
So when you're, if you're having that numbness, if you're having that lack of body aware, body awareness, when you reach into the oven, you're not accidentally bumping against the side. When you're, you know, pouring out some hot water from a pot, your hands are nice and protected because you're, you're not going to get that same feedback from your body of things are hot and I should move. Um, so especially if you're having that numbness, because by the time that signal gets to your brain, you could potentially have a burn forming there versus when you have full sensory, we, we're going to feel that burn right away. We're not going to feel it quite as quickly when we have peripheral neuropathy. Um, making sure you're staying covered in cold temperatures, so both hands and feet. Even if you're not feeling that cold, making sure you're wearing gloves and you're wearing socks can be really helpful. Um, some people will actually be more sensitive to changes in temperature, especially the cold with the peripheral neuropathy and the changes in their nerves. Um, so it can just be good practice. I have patients who make a good practice to just, the second it starts getting cold in the fall, they wear their gloves, they keep their gloves on them, even if the temperatures aren't quite that bad because they're just a little more sensitive to it. Um, and then make sure with your hands that you're visually attending to high risk tasks. So if you're chopping, you're not just relying on the feedback you're getting from your body because we know that feedback is a little different. We're visually, we're using our vision to compensate for what we're not feeling in our hands. Um, and then with our foot, especially a lot of you have reported having some numbness in the bottom of your foot. You really need to make sure if you're having a lot of numbness in your foot, you need to make sure you're visually checking the bottom of your foot daily. Um, if you can't reach down there, there are mirrors you can order that kind of are on a little pole and they, you can reach them down and you can use the mirror to check the bottom of your foot. Um, wearing comfortable shoes um, is important. If you have new shoes, checking for any blisters or um, cuts that can happen um, because we don't want, what can happen is if you have numbness and you're not seeing, you're not feeling the cut and you're not seeing the cut, um, the, the cut can get infected and get kind of damaged um, pretty quickly. Um, and you're not going to, your body's not going to give you the feedback that, you know, if you did have those nerves intact that it would be giving. So, you know, it could progress quite a ways before you're seeing it. Good. Um, oops, sorry guys. So many screens. Great. Um, and then keeping, making sure you're cleaning, keeping your hands, well, your hands are a little easier because we wash them all the time. Keeping your feet nice and clean and dry, making sure you're really drying them after the shower. You're not putting them in all moist into your socks. Um, Cause once again, you can get kind of some skin breakdown and effects on your skin that you might not feel right away. Um, and they can get more advanced if you're not noticing them visually. Um, so keeping everything clean, dry and moisturized too, because um, a lot of times with peripheral neuropathy, people report not so much in their hands, um, but in their feet changes in the, um, like the skin, the skin can change a little bit. It can be more prone to cracking. It can be more prone to dryness and redness. Um, so we want to keep that skin barrier as healthy as it can. Okay. Okay. So that was kind of a whirlwind, <laughs> but I want to make sure we got through all the slides before we got too wrapped up in discussion. Um, but let's go back. I think Ali had a comment and then um, let's go back to some of those questions I skipped over. Talked about this. Um, oh, so let's first talk about there. Um, Hold on, Ali. Let me answer your question. You were asking about, sorry, Ali, do you, I lost the chat. <laughs> you were asking about, um, does ice help? Um, okay. Yeah. Um, so ice doesn't really help. Uh, there hasn't been, it's still kind of out to debate. Um, they've been trying like some ice and cold therapy um, during treatment to see if it preserves the nerves. Um, the last study I, like that kind of looked at all that that I read kind of said they're not, there just is enough evidence or research to say it does. Um, ice can be helpful with pain. Um, it can be a nice tool in your pain management, um, but it's not necessarily helping with the nerve restoration. Whereas like physical activity we know is gonna help those nerves recover because we're getting good circulation. Um, we're challenging them a little bit more. Good. Um, has anyone tried any of the treatments we talked about? Any any of them that they found helpful? Uh, yes, Camille? I. Oh, sorry. Oh no, sorry, Camille, raise your hand. You can join next. Yes, I have tried quite okay. a few. Is, is someone else talking? No. Okay. Yeah, why don't, Camille, why I don't you Camille go ahead? 
Yeah, go yeah. ahead, Camille. Okay. Uh, yeah. <laughs> All right. Who do you want to talk? Just tell me. Camille, go ahead and start, and then we'll get to the next one. Yeah. Okay. Um, I've tried most of the things that you're suggesting, and mm -hmm. I still get a lot of pain in my feet. And I also get um sort of a sickling. It's like it's like my 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 tendons or something are are um are like in atrophy and I and my foot kind of sickles. And that's I'm the one that asked the question about the Charlie horse. It doesn't okay. stay like that, but I can it 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 goes in that it, you know, it, like I said, it it cramps up and it sickles. And then at, you know, after a while, it it like a like a Charlie horse, after a while it kind of releases. Yeah. So I've tried, you know, pr pharmaceuticals. I've tried massage, acupuncture, um, and and maybe if I didn't try any of those things, maybe the pain would be worse. But the okay. pain is still there. Um, one thing that I have done that has at least eliminated the sharpness of the pain mm -hmm. is I use a um, a muscle relaxer. You know how you buy I mean, like a Ben Gay kind of a thing. I don't use the Ben Gay, but it's you know same kind of idea. I use that along with um, a cannabis um, uh, transdermal and um, and then a foot cream. And I put that together in kind of a little like a little lotion. And I put that on my feet twice a day. And what that has done, it has eliminated that that those sharp pains that I would get in my feet. But one question I have for you too is is I'm fine. I can't balance. That's you know. But in terms of the pain. When I'm walking and I'm walking around during the day, I'm fine. But when I try to go to sleep at night, that's when the pain really, you know, comes in. So why why is that? Um, so that is a common thing I hear with patients. Um, I think that's going back to that kind of like those that distraction, like using positive emotions to distract us is um a lot of times when we're busy focusing on other stuff, our brain is less, it's attending to that stuff and it's not attending to the pain. Um, and then a lot of times it's that end of the evening, um, it, and it can be twofold, but it's that end of the evening, we're trying to relax our brain and suddenly our brain's like, wait a second, we're in pain, I forgot about it. Let me remind you, right? When you're trying to relax and go to sleep. Um, so that does happen, not even just with preferopathy, that's very common with a lot of different patients I work with who have pain. Um, so sleep hygiene, a good sleep routine can be really helpful so that we're gradually winding your body down and we're prepping your body down to sleep. Um, and also kind of some of those sleep hygiene things where we're not, you know, if you can't fall asleep right away, getting up out of bed, kind of training yourself to not stay in bed when you're having pain and you're feeling worried. Um, and you're trying to get to sleep um, for like more, you know, if that goes on for more than 20 minutes, you should get up, go do something else, kind of quiet and relaxing, come back and try again. Um, Cause that you can kind of get in that cycle of you're just focusing on the pain and you're not sleeping, which then leads to that stress cycle and makes our body feel less healthy if we're not getting enough sleep and cause the pain to be a little worse. Um, so that, that's a lot of times when people are pain, it's just that we're distracted during the day and the second our brain, we're trying to turn our brain off, it likes to kind of remind us of, it kind of re-attend our attention to the pain that it's been feeling. Um, also the end of the day, it sounds like maybe you're having some muscle weakness and muscle involvement um, that's developed over time. Um, so that too could be that as everything's fatiguing, it's gonna be a little bit more sore and more hurtful towards the end of the day as you're kind of doing the activities throughout the day. Mm -hmm. Well, even in the middle of the night, if I feel pain, if I stand on my feet, the pain goes away. But of course, okay. I can't sleep if I'm standing on my if I'm standing up. Um, so <laughs> if you said I would be impressed, but yeah, that's a little yeah. bit hard. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So I just wanted to know, like, why it's you know more painful when I when I'm not on my feet versus when I'm on my feet. Oh, okay. That could be. Have you tried like massaging or like giving some pressure to your feet? Because some people find that compression can be really helpful with the pain. So like mm -hmm. kind of gently squeezing, putting some pressure. So you're not having to stand on it, but it might be that effect of the pressure on the pain receptors. Mm -hmm. Okay. Have you seen a PT? Yes, I've, 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 I've been on this journey for a number of years. So I've okay. basically tried a little bit of everything. Okay. Did you and see someone who has more training and specifically in cancer survivors? Yes. Okay, good. Yes. Yeah, and so that is something too, is that the weakness can kind of keep coming back because pain can be very limiting. If you're feeling pain, it can really limit how much we're doing. 
Um, so if you're noticing any sudden changes, it could be nice to go back and, you know, sometimes like it happens a lot of times with patients too, we kind of get everything better. It's feeling better a year or so goes by and then they come back and things have gotten a little worse. So we just need to kind of get them set on the path again too. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. No, I'm kind of interested. I've heard a lot of anecdotal stuff from patients about some of the CBD and the cannabis creams. Um, not, you know, just like a lot of my arthritis patients really are singing its praises. I, the research hasn't come out yet, but I'm hoping that they'll get more research kind of proving that this is effective. Good. Have, uh, is it, I'm sorry, is it Njoki? I want to make sure I'm saying your name correctly. Absolutely. You are a very rare person. To say. All right. <laughs> more credit. Go yes. ahead. Okay, thank you. Uh, so, uh, yeah, my uh, neur neuropathy, you know, pre pre chemotherapy had a slight, you know, like, you know, tingling on the bottom of my feet, but, you know, that, you know, I didn't, you know, it, it wasn't, in, you know, it wasn't causing any problems. Once I, I got the mastectomy and then I did chemo, uh, then all of that went away. I didn't have any of that at all. And I thought, oh, this is this is wonderful. And then when I and then when I I think I had just uh like maybe three weeks or so before the end of chemo, April 7th, uh I started to feel the numbness. First of all, the pain on my 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 fingers. Uh and the oncologist said that was neuropathy. And yeah. I got some medication. Um and duloxetine, uh, and you know the, the 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 pain went away, but then uh, the numbness returned. The numbness replaced the pain, and then my then now I really got the severe dose of neuropathy on my toes and on my on the bottom of my feet. Mm -hmm. uh, so so the question I have is there is obviously no magical answer to this, but. Uh, the oncologist said something like, give me a baseline of a year, you know, like um, that's when I'll know whether I am one of the lucky people uh, that the neuropathy will go away will have, or that it won't have gone away. Uh, mm -hmm. So, so um, anything you can share around that, that's one. Number two, how would I get a good uh, you know, are you seeing an occupational therapist or is it a physical therapist? A physical therapist who actually has expertise in neuropathy. Yeah, so, um, okay, good question. So I would say, yes, like, I, I, I would say, like, yes, you might be one of the lucky ones, um, but let's, like, hedge your bet and, and let's do, I mean, it's good to get into physical therapy, it's good to get active, it's good to start implementing some of these pain management strategies um, because you want to kind of cut off that pain as quickly as it can. The more chronic pain becomes, the more it gets kind of set in our system, it gets set in our brain, and it can be harder to break that cycle. Um, so I would say like, you know, yeah, it, it can take, like we said, we are seeing these people who are recovering um, and it can take six months to a year. Um, we still don't fully understand it, like whether after a year you know, it's not like there's a timeline that we can say, like, after a year, this is going to be forever. Um, we're still understanding some of that. Um, so I think it'd be really helpful to get into physical therapy if it's affecting your feet more, or if you're noticing more in your hands, maybe seeing an OT. Um, it sounds like your feet are kind of more the issue right now. Um, so um, there are more cancer rehab programs that are opening up. So they're all going to have some training in peripheral neuropathy, specific cancer survivors. Um, sometimes it can kind of depend where your insurance will cover. So making sure you're calling, you know, you can look up physical therapists that are near you, um, that, and, um, like if you're going to just an outpatient center, calling and asking if they have somebody who's familiar with this diagnosis and has a background in it, um, because they're all PTs and OTs. We all get some amount of training in it, but it's just beneficial to find somebody who's got that specialized training, um, a lot of the hospitals in the area do have cancer rehab clinics that are emerging. So checking where you're at or checking at nearby hospitals can be a good place to start. Okay. Good. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks for sharing. Maria? 
Oh, Maria, oh, I think you're still muted. You're on mute, Maria. Maria, can you hear us? You're on, you're on mute, sweetie. There you go. Oh, I think it's still, still muted. On, still on mute. There we go. I had, I had rest, I had, uh, was diagnosed with uh, endometrial cancer in 2007. And then I had, uh, I was, I had to take it again uh, in 2011. But I've been in remission since, mm -hmm. and I've always had uh, the numbness and the and the and the fingers and in the toes. But every time I went, they they never addressed it, or I mean, they didn't think it was that important. Yeah, I mean, I it was tolerable. I really didn't pay too much attention. I thought, you know, after the cancer, after the treatments, it would go away. But what I've noticed is that the past two years, especially when it gets cold, my my fingers really get bother me. Yeah, I, I've used a special thermal gloves. I've used two, you know, <laughs> two special ones, and it still seems like it's still it still you know bothers me. And just these past two years, I've noticed a change just in my hands. And then also in the winter, it seems like the cold affects me more than it ever did. <laughs> but I don't know if it's because of age. That could be it. Or So uh, you mentioned something about that there is different therapies or something, or some hospitals have places that maybe address it or something. Yeah, I mean, it wouldn't hurt to, like, it never hurts to see, like, especially if you're noticing a lot of, the numbness can be kind of hard to treat, um, but if you're noticing it's hard to do a lot of functional tasks and be nice, like, you know, picking up fine motor stuff or you're, like, buttoning buttons, that type of thing, it would be nice to see an OT just to see if there's, because a lot of times when we're, our movement patterns kind of rely on the feedback from our fingers, right, so with that touch really tells us, like, oh, I've got the button and we're not usually visually attending or mentally attending to the task. We're doing these kind of automatic tasks. Um, so when you have numbness interfering with that, um, it can be really helpful to, um, you know, kind of retrain yourself on some of these tasks. So you change the way that your brain is telling your body to move. And we're relying. I, I, I don't. I don't have difficulty with buttoning or anything like that. When right. I sometimes with the cell phone, when I try to answer, and it it did that. It, it seems like it doesn't. It's not moving the finger or, you know, like the touch. I don't feel the touch, you know, like that's difficulty. But uh, those, yeah, I was just wondering if, yeah, I, maybe I'll check those out. Yeah, I wouldn't hurt. Um, there are a lot of a lot of phones and a lot of computers have a lot of built-in adaptations. Um, so keyboards can be hard a lot to, um, so there's different like settings and stuff you can play around with that can change how your, um, how it's like perceiving your touch or how much pressure you have to do. Or if you're accidentally, like if you accidentally hit the wrong key a lot on a keyboard, you can turn off something that it's, it's so it's filtering, like, and it's not taking every keystroke. It's only taking the definite ones. Um, so th there are those out there. Um, if you're not tech savvy, you're aware of them. Um, an OT can be helpful and kind of- Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. yeah, no problem. Caitlin, we have a couple things in the chat if you were able to check that out. We have uh, Lynette, okay. starting with Lynette, who asked, how effective is acupuncture? Yes, um, so that is in the handout. I did not have it in my slides, but not acupuncturist. Um, but acupuncture um, of some of the treatments we have out there does, I mean, it's, there's not a lot of huge studies, but it does have some really good promising um, research on showing its positive effects for for neuropathy. Um, so part of it with acupuncture, you're getting some of that, like, like physical therapy and other things, you're getting some of that return of circulation and, and sensation. Um, and then also acupuncture is really helping us relax um, our system. So we're getting kind of preventing that pain stress cycle. Um, so yeah, I always, um, I always tell patients that it's worth trying because it can be really beneficial and there's not really any harmful side effects of acupuncture. So it's worth trying because a lot of people really report it can be helpful with pain. Um, and there is an organization, I have it here. If you're in Chicago. You know what, Caitlin, can we stop sharing your screen? 
so we yeah. can see everyone. Okay, great. No problem. There we go. Perfect. Great. Um, yeah. So um, there is Five Point Holistic Health has free like community acupuncture where it's um, every week. Um, where it's at a discount. Um, so that's something to look there. And there's a couple of different acupuncture places that have these kind of trial things you can do. So it's worth trying for sure. All right, let's go back. Um, I see Doris yeah, has so a comment. Yeah, it looks like Doris. Um, so Doris used the Burt's Bee Peppermint Foot Lotion. Um, so did that help with, it seems like that helped with some of the pain, um, menthol, a lot of the pain creams can be helpful. Like, um, biofreeze is menthol based. Um, and a lot of people notice that can be really helpful for the pain management. Um, what it's doing is kind of flooding those peppermint or their, those menthol based ones are flooding those sensory receptors and help, helping them turn off temporarily. So those can be really helpful. Does massage help, uh, a lot or I, I don't know what helps. Uh, more because I'm doing massage and acupuncture. Does massage help a lot if I have uh, numbness and pain in my feet? Um, you know, I don't know specifically the research for massage, um, but it is, you know, if you're releasing, like if you're getting a lot of muscle tension, massage can be really helpful for that. It can be really helpful for stress management. Um, so if you're able to do both um, and it's helping, you know, um, I, I've only just happened upon the studies on our acupuncture, acupuncture. That's kind of come up a lot. Um, not to say that massage isn't, I just haven't really looked at the research on that. Specific. And what's better for circula circula circulation? If uh, I'm doing bicycle, home bicycle, or I'm mm -hmm. walking, but I'm walking with walker without yeah. my hands moving. Because yeah. of my balance, I'm walking with walker only. Okay, yeah, that's good. What better, bicycle or walking in my case? Um, I feel like whatever you're comfortable with. So if you're worried about your balance and walking around like in the neighborhood, um, and you know, I mean, it's always good to address the okay CPT to so feel confident. Okay. Um, but any, I, any physical activity is gonna be helpful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I would say any safe physical activity. We don't want any falls. Good. Um, so somebody asked about neuropathy traveling up the leg. You can definitely have that shooting pain that goes up your leg. Um, like that we kind of saw our nerves go throughout our whole body. So even if the source of the pain is at your foot, you can have, you can have that feeling of pain traveling up and down that nerve pathway. Good. And we had a question from Yvonne as well in there. And then the bottom of my feet, no one asked you to take questions. Um, yeah, so gabapentin can be helpful. Um, I would say if you haven't done physical therapy, it can be helpful to go see a physical therapist. Sometimes orthotics can be helpful, adjustments to shoes. Um, some of the specialized shoes that are meant to be more comfortable and supportive can be really helpful. They can kind of advise on that. Um, if it's something you've been dealing with for a while, I would really look at kind of maybe seeing a pain specialist um, or a pain psychologist, somebody who can work on that pain management plan um, that we kind of talked about at the beginning, um, establishing all that stuff off, because it sounds very easy, but it's very hard to put this practice in place. So seeing like a, a therapist that's really specialized in pain, um, for any of you, I know a lot of you have said you've been dealing with this for a long time. Um, and if you kind of feel like you've exhausted some of these physical um, treatments, talking to a pain psychologist can be really helpful to help with that kind of managing those cognitive aspects of pain. Yes, Doris, it sounds like dropping a lot of things. Um, yes, so paying attention, visual attention to that, because like that, that's kind of like we talked about that feedback, our hand, our brain relies on that touch to help us remember what we're doing. Um, and so, um, it, when we're not visually attending it, if it's not getting that touch feedback, we'll find dropping, dropping is a com common side effect, patients say. Um, so if you're holding things, trying to, um, really make sure you're visually attending or mentally attending to what you're doing and not getting too distracted. Um, sometimes too, like keys, if you put like a more textured key, keychain on your keys, something that's going to give you a little more feedback can help with that too. Um, and then, you know, kind of seeing some, if it's really a problem with a lot of things and OT can kind of help you with some of these kind of modification of tasks to help with some of that, because we just have to relearn how we're using our hands. 
It looks like Camille. Yeah, somebody else. I think. Yeah, I think that. Who? Oh, Camille. Yeah, go ahead, Camille. Yeah. Okay. So we've talked a lot about what you do when you have neuropathy, mm -hmm. but the treatment that I'm on right now seems one of the side effects is is one of the minor side effects. It's not one of the major side effects. I had. I got my neuropathy from the Taxol. Yeah. No. So. But now I'm on another one. It's called, um, and I can never pronounce it, but it's trizabibab or something like that. But it's okay. a, it's one of the uh, targeted cell therapies. Okay. And um, so it's one of the minor side effects. So I do, I am starting to feel more tingling in my arms and legs and hands. So mm -hmm. is there something that I can do to stave off any further neuropathy? Yeah, so staying active, trying to keep that circulation because that's going to promote anytime we're getting good circulation and movement and strengthening to our hands, that's promoting our body's natural kind of healing capabilities. Um, if you're concerned about it, I think it's really important to kind of have a conversation with your oncologist um, and like make sure they're aware of the symptoms. Sometimes, right, like there aren't that many choices in dosage or you might have to be on a specific um, chemotherapy. Um, so sometimes it is something we're just trying to stave off, but it's worth bringing up and kind of advocating for yourself a little bit and make sure they understand that like, I already had this neuropathy and now I'm feeling it worse and to have a conversation whether they can safely kind of change the drug or change the distribution to have less effects. Okay, thank you. Yeah, no problem. Folks, I'm going to just for now, I'm going to stop the recorded portion of this. We will stick around if you have more questions. I think Caitlin has some time left if, if you're willing to stay. So I just want to say, so hang tight if you want to ask more questions. But uh, to conclude the recording part, I want to thank Caitlin for coming from Physio Partners. Um, we will, so you guys know, we will put this up on our website um, under the video library at www.gildasclubchicago.org. So thank you guys so much and uh, hang tight past recording if you'd like to stay. Bye-bye. Thanks, guys. Hi, Caitlin.